pray. Father, we ask you to bless your word now in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Lord and Savior. Amen. You may be seated. There is a move on or a trend on in this country and the world, particularly in the country we live in, to dethrone Christ. He is not what he used to be in America. He used to be looked upon as a counselor, a guide. In fact, that's why there's a certain part of our nation that is called the Bible Belt, but it isn't the Bible teaching belt as much as it used to be. The Apostle Paul writes that when Jesus comes again, note this in 1 Timothy 6.15, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is a dethroning of Christ in the movie theaters. There's a dethroning of Christ in many churches. There's a dethroning of Christ in the nation that we live in, in government. Paul is saying in essence here then, when Christ comes, he's going to show everyone he is Lord. He is Lord. What does the term Lord mean? It means simply this. Why call me Lord, Lord, said Jesus, and do not the things I tell you to do. Who's in charge when Jesus is my Lord? It's easy to say he is my Lord and Savior, but is he my Lord in essence, in truth? Is he really calling the shots in my life, or am I doing what I want to do while I accept him as my Savior? I do not follow what he says in the word. The word of God tells me how to live the life that will glorify God. If I'm not responding to that as it's being declared to me or I'm reading it in the word of God, then he is not my Lord. He is my Savior, but he hasn't become my Lord. You know, the Word of God says that in many cases, people need a conversion. Conversion is not salvation. It's thinking God's way. It's living according to the Word of God. Conversion is you begin to be a godly person in essence. What did God say to Peter? He said, when you are converted... Strengthen your brethren. He was saved before he was converted, but he didn't think God's way. He didn't live God's way. In fact, he repudiated Jesus when he said, I've got to go to Jerusalem and die on the cross. And he said, that's not going to happen. Many people are called of God to do things that they don't do. If God says witness to that person, you think of somebody that can go over there and witness to that person, but God told you to witness to that person. He isn't Lord of your life until you obey or I obey what God has told me to do. It isn't always an easy thing. In fact, it's often not easy at all. It is against human nature to give over the reins to somebody you cannot see somebody that you will have to give an answer to one day, and that's God Almighty. Note number one on the screen, if you will. God the Father enthroned Christ as king over all nations and over all nature and as Lord over the church. Now notice that Jesus Christ is enthroned upon all nations, not some nations, all nations, and they have dethroned Christ in some of those nations, and our nation is on the verge of doing that in many different ways, and in fact is doing it in some ways. They're dethroning Jesus. They don't go to prayer and then react to what God says to them after prayer. They follow politics. 
but they don't follow God. We must be people of God that follow God. When we go into the voting booth, we must pray, God, whom do you want me to vote for? And we must be led by the Spirit in pulling it and voting for the person that God wants us to have, not the person that we may politically desire, but what is God's will. When you go to church, God doesn't want you just to take in if he's Lord of your life. He wants you to ask him, who can I give it out to? Maybe in the body of Christ, in the church, maybe outside the church. But whom can I give what I've learned from God through his word out to someone else? It isn't that we are trying to grow up without giving out. I find that the more people fill themselves with the things of God, the more they become like a sponge full of water and if it doesn't squeeze out, you can't fill it anymore. So it's very important that whatever we receive, we're willing to give, and we ask God, who do you want me to give it to? Paul is saying it doesn't matter what things look like on the outside. It may look like the devil's in charge, but he's not. He is a loser, and I don't think... Oh, goodbye, devil. He never wants to hear the truth. He abides in a lie. And because he abides in a lie, he peddles that lie to people who are gullible enough to listen to the devil. Anything negative is from the devil. Anything positive is from God Almighty. So I'm to build each other up, not to tear each other down. If I start tearing each other down in my mind, then I'm not being led by the Spirit and I don't have the Lord giving me direction. He wants me to build up the body of Christ who will build up other people, who will build up other people and take the world for Jesus Christ. The world needs Jesus. Satan begins to say to us, you can't do it. Somebody else has got to do it. But you've got to be led by the Spirit to know where in the world does God want you to be led by the Spirit and witness. Now, Pastor Cliff Vincent has been lately putting on uh, the Internet a beautiful description of how to witness as a missionary. We're all missionaries. We're all missionaries, and I've found it such a blessing to hear from somebody in Brazil as a missionary how to reach people in all the world because it applies to everyone in all the world. So the Word of God is so important for us to give to another, but if we don't study it, we can't give it accurately. We must give the Word of God as it is written in its context so that we do not lead people astray. The Word of God says very clearly that unless a person receives Jesus Christ as their Savior, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. They cannot see the kingdom of God. Did not Jesus say that to Nicodemus, a Pharisee? an individual who was very religious but not going to heaven? There are many people in many churches that are very religious. They have a religious trend in their lives, a desire, but they don't know Jesus Christ, and they can't get to heaven by knowing religion or even the Bible. You have to receive Christ to really understand how a person can be saved. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shared for my life way back on Calvary. And I'm saved forever, not for a time as long as I follow certain rules. God knows how to correct his children, but when he saves us, it's forever, eternally. And that's what the Word of God says. The truth is God has put all things 
under the feet of Jesus, not under the feet of some nation, national leader. In Colossians, the first chapter, verses 16 to 18, we read these words. For in Jesus, in Jesus, all things were created. That's important to know. There isn't anything that has been created that Jesus Christ did not create. It goes on. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible things he created, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, the powers that be are ordained of God for a purpose, but he ordained those powers. All things have been created through him and for him. Jesus is the center of this teaching. He is the one that all glory goes to, all of creation responds to. It goes on in verse 17 to say, He is beyond all things, or before all things, and in him all things hold together. I don't have to worry about this earth bursting apart. Jesus is holding it together. I don't have to worry about my body breaking loose from each other, every cell just scattering around. That would be a sight. <laughs> the reality is Jesus is holding them together. He holds all things together. Now going on, and he is the head of the body. What's the body? It is the church. The Bible makes that very clear. The body of Christ is the church of Jesus Christ. What is the church? Is it a building? No, it's not. We call this building a church, but it isn't the church he's talking about or the body he's talking about. The church of Jesus Christ is made up of everyone that has received Christ as their Savior. So within the building called the church, there are people that are the body of Christ or the church of Jesus Christ, and there are people that have not come to that state yet. So there will be many people when the rapture takes place that will still be in the pews in America because they never received Jesus Christ as their Savior, and thus they did not become the body of Christ or the church of Jesus Christ. The Word of God says, as we go on, he is the beginning, that is Jesus, and the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might have, notice this word, the supremacy. He is the one in charge. So Satan comes along and he tries to take over. He can't take over the child of God that has the armor of God on and simply abides in the truth and leans on God at every point of their life for the strength they need to live the Christian life. In myself, I could not live the Christian life. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. But I have Jesus, and because I have Jesus, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. You see, the reality here is this. God is in control, so don't begin to get pessimistic and say, looks like the world's going to hell in a basket. Jesus Christ is in control. He's letting the devil out just a little bit, but one day he'll draw him in, and he'll cast him along with the church, casting him into the lake of fire for eternity. Jesus is supreme. Now, you can dethrone him, but you cannot really dethrone him. You know what I'm saying? You can say, Jesus is not in control of my life. And if you've received Christ as your Savior, you're waiting for a spanking. Those I love, I chasten. If you're really saved, Jesus is going to keep you on the right path. I've, I've seen many people in my life as a pastor who strayed. They backslid. But Jesus never let them go. They came back in time. They came back. Sometimes it's 
a year, sometimes it's two years, sometimes it may be ten years. I don't know how long, but Jesus is like the hound of heaven going after them because he will not lose his sheep. He is in control once I receive him as my Savior, and that's why I say very clearly, you and I, if we truly receive Christ as our Savior, cannot, cannot, there is no possible way for us to lose our salvation. Jesus keeps us saved by the grace of God. Each of these passages then that I have read prove that the Almighty has appointed Jesus, the Father has appointed Jesus as King, Lord, and Potentate. That means simply he's in charge. Number two on the screen, if you will. Yet all around us today, we see our society and our governments dethroning Christ, refusing to acknowledge his authority and his kingship. We've removed God from our schools in America. Now notice what's happening in our schools. They blame guns. I blame removing God from our schools. We have removed God not only from our schools but from our courts. So many innocent people end up in the penitentiaries, in the jails, and the prisons of America. And we find that out much later on because when Jesus is removed from justice, you get injustice in many cases. Now, the Word of God also makes it clear that Americans have ignored the laws of God. When you ignore the laws of God, you can't even have the Ten Commandments in the court buildings or the schools any longer. What's so wrong with the Ten Commandments? Do we want people to kill? Do we want people to lie? Do we want people to commit all kinds of sin? Of course we don't, but we remove that which states don't do this because it comes from God. So we dethrone what God says and we begin to live what is right in our own eyes and you see what has happened in America in our schools lately. I believe America's rejection of Christ's lordship is the reason behind the bloodshed in America, the violence in America, the racial hatred in America, the moral decay in America, and perhaps the world, drug abuse, and the outbreak of sexual diseases, all because America, at least, has removed Jesus Christ from being supreme authority. That wouldn't happen if we were not removing Christ from his central position of being in charge. When I grew up, they were beginning to move Christ from the schools, but they hadn't to this point that they have now or from the courts or from the government, and so things weren't so bad back there. I could go to school and not even have a thought that someone would come in and uh, kill my, myself and other classmates. I, I wouldn't even have had that thought. But little by little, you erode the teachings of Jesus Christ, and you say, let's separate church and state, which, by the way, the Constitution, the government does not have a right to do. It is not there as they state it is. You separate those two, and you end up with chaos. Chaos. And it's a reality, and many people are experiencing it, but they don't know why. They don't know why. They have not read the Word of God, or they know why. It grieves God. It grieves God to see America, I think, one of the greatest countries started by God in all the world, one of them, to see this country going the way it's going. 
because they won't listen to God and his word. They won't listen. They are doing what is right in their own eyes, and their own eyes are not good. The prophet Hosea speaks of this issue of rejecting the Lord's counsel. Hosea, uh, yes, Hosea describes the terrible harvest reaped by those who dethrone God from his lordship and turn to the arms of the flesh. What is it that they experience? He wrote <coughs> prophetic messages, and he addressed people who had caused Christ, or God in that case, to just simply get out of their way. We want to do it our way. Every time they chose to do it their way and not listen to God's way, they got into trouble. But they learned and repented. And then down the road, they didn't repent and they got into trouble over and over and over so that they actually ended up as a nation that had committed apostasy in every sense of that term. What was the awful sin they committed? What made God abandon them? Simply this. They simply said, I don't need your counsel anymore, God. I don't need your word any longer. I don't want the prophets prophesying to me negative things in my eyes. I want to hear smooth things, things that I can enjoy and go out of uh, the presence of you, the prophet, and feel good all the time. When a church service doesn't make you feel miserable if you're on the skids, you're going away from what God said, then that church service or that pastor is not speaking from the word of God. I should, if I'm going astray, I should be warned of it through God, through the pastor, through the message that he preaches from God's word. I should be warned of it before I've gone too far down that path. For once I get down that path, I will not see the error of my ways, nor will I want to receive it until God has to take a heavy hand and uh, do what he does that my mother used to do to me. It's called a spanking. It's called a spanking. Now, if you'll note number three on the screen. In God's eyes, the greatest wickedness a believer could commit is to no longer be dependent on him. No longer do I need to depend on you. My life becomes prayerless. My study of God's word becomes less and less. My attendance to the services that God told me that I must attend as I see the day approaching much more, it becomes less and less instead of much the more. And I end up straying away from what God had a plan for me to do. And thus I never accomplish the plan of God unless I repent and come back. In essence, the Lord is telling Israel, and he tells us the same thing wherever we are in all this world, you no longer put your trust in me. You're trusting in your armament. You're trusting in your power. You're trusting in your wisdom. You're trusting in everything but God. But you used to trust in me, Israel. I am no longer your guide, your source of wisdom. You reject my words to you, and you stone my prophets, and you have turned away from me. You have dethroned me in your life. You know, there have been some beautiful, beautiful missionaries that have gone out on the field, and thank God this has not happened to the Vincents. But they've gone out onto the field, and they've been killed like Jim Elliot. They have been disregarded as a servant of God and driven out of a country because they are not preaching the politics of that country. 
They've been taken off television because they're preaching the word of God, and that's not permitted if you talk against abortion and you talk against homosexuality. All those things, they come after big ministries in particular because they have more effect on the world simply because they're not preaching that which they want them to preach. You know, in some countries, you have to submit your messages before you can actually preach them. And if you don't preach according to what they have said you can preach, you get thrown out of that country or something worse. The reality is it takes a real servant of Jesus Christ, whether a preacher or whether a missionary or whether an average person, to stay true to the word of God even though persecution may come your way. All those that live godly in Christ Jesus have been promised persecution. I've had it in my lifetime. Very often I've had it. Most of the time I've had it. But I can tell you this. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and you will be able to remain faithful over the years because he gives us that strength. He gives us that strength. Consider the tragic results of dethroning Christ as counselor, as keeper, as provider, and the source of your wisdom. Hosea lists about a dozen results. We're not going to deal with a dozen that befall those who dethrone Christ. And I want to give you just four of those dozen. Number four on the screen. First, Israel is an empty vine because she's dethroned Christ. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Everyone in Israel was looking out for himself. And the result was total emptiness. What was one of their problems? Why did God have such a problem with these people they weren't concerned with the word of God. They were more concerned with what they wanted, what they desired. For me to live, Paul said in the New Testament, is Christ. It isn't what the world wants. It's not what I want. It's what Christ wants. That was Paul's desire. But Israel at this point had come to the point where they didn't want God to direct their lives. They refused his counsel, and they wanted what was good for them. I wouldn't be here today if I wanted what was good for me. I want what's good for you and God. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying you can't want what is good for yourself and serve God. You must want what God wants and only what God wants. Secondly, number five, their heart is divided. They were not only selfish, but their heart was divided. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. You see what he's saying? They had other gods. Do we have other gods? Is the reason I don't go to some service or I don't read the word of God more often or I don't pray more often, is it because I'm too busy with something else that's my God? I remember when I was young, it went around that people couldn't go to a certain service because it was during the time of their soap opera. They couldn't miss that soap opera. I remember when I was little, I, I, I would stay home from school now and then, and my mother would be viewing a soap opera. Do you know that stupid soap opera was repeated during the summer, the very same episode? You see, if your God is something other than the God, and the God is not the one that calls the shots for you and directs you and guides you, then you have another God. And you're like Israel in that respect. They had other gods, and God came in, and he said, I'm going to tear these things down. I'm going to rid you of them. If you won't let them go, I'm going to take them right down myself. And then 
what God will you have left? You've already alienated me. You've already said you will not follow me. So what God are you going to have when your other gods are all destroyed? That's the second reason. America's pay lip service to God and their religion, but they don't worship the Lord in truth. They go to church, but do they know Jesus as their Savior? Are they sold out to Jesus as their Savior? They appear to be religious on the outside, but inside they're full of dead man bones. That's what Jesus said of the religious people of his day. And then he said, you make one convert and you make them twice as fit for hell. What an awful way to live. I'm religious. But when I make one person follow that religion, I make them twice as fit for hell. There's going to be a lot of surprises when Jesus Christ comes and he separates the sheep from the goats, and you find out you were an old goat. You didn't know it. It's a sad thing. You see, he knows my heart. God looks upon the heart. Man looks upon the outward appearance. I may have a beautiful suit on, but inside I'm old. <laughs> so the reality is this. You can look good. You can, if you want to have your face lifted 25,000 times, it will not stop the aging process from killing you in time. So the reality is Jesus is looking on the heart, and he looks upon the heart of those in Israel at that time, and he says, your heart is corrupt. So I've got to do something because you won't do something about it to tear down these other gods that you've been following along with me. I will have no other gods before me. The word of God is clear on that. Number six. Third, you have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity because you did trust in your way in the multitude of your mighty man. Hosea is saying, you stop trusting in the Lord. You stop trusting in the Lord. You're worried about your finances because you're not trusting in the Lord. You're worried about your health because you're not trusting in the Lord. You're worried about COVID. And I, I, I know there's some cautions that one should take, but you don't live and worry about it because you don't trust God is going to take care of you. God will take care of you. Be not dismay, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. We sing the song, but do we really believe it? Oh, somebody did when they wrote it, but do we? Hosea is saying, you've stopped trusting in the Lord. Now you're going to reap a harvest of iniquity. Whatever you sow, you shall also reap. So sow faith in God. Sow listening to the guidance of God. Sow rejoicing in the Spirit. Sow whatever God says is a good sowing so that you'll produce the best crop you've got. I heard a long time ago, when you're planting a garden, you don't put old seeds from some time back in and expect they're going to do as well as new seeds. I didn't follow that. Guess what? Whoever said that said a truth. Now it's new plants. It's not even seeds any longer. It's new plants. Whatever I sow, I will reap. If I sow a plant and I take care of that plant and I simply do everything I can and trust God will do what he can, then I'm going to have a lot of nice, ripe tomatoes. But if I don't pay any attention to them, and in some cases... 
they say you take off the sucker because they s they take away the power of the plant. There's a lot of suckers that you're not taking away. I'll let God describe those to you. Number seven. They said, fourthly, we have no king because we fear not the Lord. We have no one in charge over us. Israel's, began, Israel's uh, backsliding began when they lost their faith to let God be God in their life and were led by the Spirit and not their emotions. I find the church is very seriously, in many churches at least, I've seen this in the life that I've had in the churches that I've pastored, there are so many people that depend on their emotions or their own, own understanding of something rather than seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't want Jiminy Cricket to be my guide. I want Jesus to be my guide through his Holy Spirit. I want to be led by the Spirit, not led by other people's desires for my life or my own desires for my life. I want to be led by the Spirit of God. And if we do, he will guide us. He will guide us. And the reality of that is simply we don't take the leadership. We let God take the leadership. God is in charge. In Psalm 29, verses 10 to 9, we read, 10 to 11, excuse me, we read this. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Is there peace in your life? If you trust God, there's peace that passes all understanding. If you have given your life to God and you have sought his word and you're led by the spirit of God, then whatever you find yourself in, you now know that Jesus will take care of you. Jesus will bless according to his plan for your life. Number eight. Sin is seen in psychological terms today as a disease. It's called a disease. Sin is just a disease like any other disease, and you just have to live with that disease. Well, what do you do about that disease? Well, I don't know, but it, we're going to call it a disease. Drug addiction is called a weakness. It's not called what it is. Why am I, dr why am I uh, addicted to some drug? Because I was depending on something other than God, and it took me over. If I depend on anything other than God, then that anything is going to eventually take me over. So what I need to do is I need to switch my dependence and put it on God. I don't need a cigarette. I don't need alcohol. I don't need some drug to make me feel good I only need Jesus I only need Jesus and God says try me you'll find out if you abandon all those other things and you point to Jesus that Jesus will satisfy all these years as a pastor I've depended on Jesus because sometimes I only had Jesus had a wonderful wife, have a wonderful wife. But Jesus is the center of our lives. And depending on Jesus, we become able to cope in the midst of anything that comes our way. That's the word of God. It isn't some disease that I can't get rid of. Jesus has freed me from any disease that would potentially take me. It isn't some weakness that I can't get rid of. I'm always going to have it as something that Jesus has delivered me from. Note number nine. In many churches today, Jesus is no longer the source 
and the power behind God's people. He's no longer the source and the power behind God's people. Have you removed God, Christ, Jesus from being the center of your life? Oh, I know you've received Christ as your Savior, you say, but is Jesus all you need? Have you found in him everything you need? And is he everything to you so that you can face anything through the power of the Holy Spirit of God? I hope so. I pray so. Let me show you as we conclude some benefits to keeping Jesus Christ enthroned in your life and not taking him away. Perhaps you're saying, I want Jesus to be king of my life. Well, let's try doing it God's way. Number 11, number 10. First, those who submit to Christ's lordship will be infused with his holiness. Those who simply submit to Jesus being the controller of their life, all for Jesus, all for Jesus, they will find that God gives them a walk with him that is holy in the eyes of God. Scripture says if you submit yourself to Jesus, waiting to receive his counsel and his direction, you'll partake of his holiness. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 9 to 10. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits, God the Father, and live? They disciplined us for a little while as best as they thought, but God disciplines us for good in order that we may share in his holiness. God wants to bring us up in the way that he knows is best. And when we come before God, if we submit to the way he knows is best, and let him bring us up. He can say to us on that day we see him well done. Thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful in the few things I gave you to do. I will make you ruler over many things. What does that mean? I, I gather it simply means this. God is going to bless you out of your orbit when you go to heaven. Because you've been faithful over the things God has given you here. The best is yet to come. And God has given us that reality. So submit to the Lord's Lordship. Number 11. Second, those who submit to Christ's Lordship will walk in peace. Those who submit to Christ's Lordship will walk in peace. You'll have a peace in your life that you've never had in all your days. When you go to sleep at night, wouldn't it be good if you felt at peace? When you get up in the morning, wouldn't it be excellent if you knew this day you were going to dwell in peace? And how do you dwell in peace? By submitting to God and saying, I want to follow you today like I followed you yesterday and the day before and the day before. I just want to keep on following you and know when my last breath comes that you're satisfied with me. You're satisfied with me because I lived only for Jesus. Number 12. Third those who submit to Christ's lordship have an increase of strength and knowledge of the Lord. Those who submit to his lordship have an increase of strength and knowledge of the Lord. If we submit to Jesus, we will never lack anything anything. 
So note number 13. Fourth, God will keep those who submit to his lordship blameless, blameless to the day of Christ's coming. If we submit, God will guide us and direct us. God cares. Let us put ourselves in his hands. And in closing, let me read you a few verses, just a few verses, seven verses from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. The mountains were symbolic of God's presence. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He's going to watch out for you. He who watches out for you will not slumber. He will not go to sleep. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. Then listen to these last two verses. The Lord will keep you from all harm if he's your Lord. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. What kind of a blessing can you ever top that one with you can't God has promised if I will follow him and keep him on the throne of my life then he will bless me with blessings I cannot even imagine on this earth and eternal blessings that exceed that so much more let's pray father we come to you and we don't want to ever dethrone you from our life. We want you on the throne of our life, and we want you to guide and direct us and to lead us in the way we should go. We want to be a light to the world that they have in need of seeing. We want, Father, to represent you so that others see us and glorify our Father which is in heaven. We don't want them to see us. We're a voice, as John the baptizer said, crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Help us to be one who cries out, turn to Jesus, turn to Jesus. For Jesus is the answer to your problems. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you that are watching by the Internet or by public access, have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior? I didn't ask you, are you religious? I didn't ask you if you go to church. I asked you, have you ever asked Jesus to forgive your sins come into your life and save you. If you have not, oh, please do that now. I beg you by the mercies of God, as Paul stated, that you present your life under God, a holy sacrifice. Give him your life. Receive Jesus as your Savior if you have not. Simply say this, Jesus Forgive me for my sins. Oh, come into my life. Save me and help me to live a life that glorifies you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you turn with